working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hello, this is Matthew Krause, and you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today, my guest is Marcus Finney. Marcus is an incredible drummer who learned to play drums as a kid in the church where his mom played the organ. He has toured and recorded several years with Grammy Award winner Kirk Whalem and has also worked with Grammy-winning artists such as Donna Summer, Larry Carlton, Earl Clue, Billy Preston, and many more. Marcus teaches at the Nashville Jazz Workshop and fronts his own band, the Marcus Finney Band. To find out about this podcast and other podcasts that we've done, go to workingdrummer.net. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on iTunes, where you can subscribe to this podcast. While you're on iTunes, you can rate and review our podcast. That helps us grow. I also want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound. Now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums. From the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern almighty Japanese Birch recording kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legends Eddie Bayers and the Smashing Pumpkins Jimmy Chamberlain and Tedeschi Trucks Band J.J. Johnson and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai. www.SakaiDrums.com So let's get to it. Here is Marcus Finney. There's a client that comes in from Seattle every year and will block out two weeks here at Ocean Way, at least the last four years that I've done it. He's been doing it for much longer than me, than, than, than I've been a part. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, we'll um, come in, he'll, he'll block out two weeks and have different schedules for everyone depending on the song. And he, I think, just stocks up on different artists um, different ages, different styles, oh, wow. and um, they'll come in. So right now, currently downstairs, there are um, there's a girl group down there, a young girl group. Mm-hmm. They are doing, I think, overdubs right now with their vocals. And uh, tomorrow it'll be a completely different thing. Um, on through the end of you know this this run that we're here, so. It's it's been interesting because we would record a jazz like a straight ahead thing, or mm. then we'll do Afro Cuban thing, and then we'll do a country thing, then we'll do mm. a eighties pop thing, or a nineties rock thing, or something like that. I mean, we'll do some of the most eclectic stuff in one day. Yeah. So um, it's almost like building a catalog uh, uh, of. Um, Muzak or something mm-hmm. to a degree um so yeah we'll we'll this year we this particular week the music we've been doing have been um has been more um more pop than than i can remember from the previous years okay you know hardly any time usage mm. um just kick snare hat Mainly deep mm-hmm. tune snare, high pitch snare, yeah, dance, funky, you know, right, depends. So, well, I know that there's oftentimes when you're working on a record or one project with one artist, sometimes we'll switch out a ride cymbal, mm-hmm. have like half a dozen or more snare drums to choose from, and right. get a feel for the song. And it right. sounds like that's what you're doing within. If you're covering a certain style with with one of the artists, correct. Maybe this week isn't the best example, but maybe in the past when you've covered a wide range of styles, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. is there anything more about your setup that might change? Because right now, from what I've seen, you're doing two up, two down. Mm-hmm. Is that the normal setup for you? Yeah, I mean, I I default to that. I mean, I don't mind using less toms or mm-hmm. no toms but mm-hmm. my default setup are two racks two floors mm-hmm. um occasionally i'll have a rack and a floor yeah um and and it does it kind of changes 
I, 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 I am a firm believer in whatever is going to make the drummer, the artist himself or herself play a particular way. It's almost like when you tune a drum, your snare drum or swap a snare and it, comp- it kind of changes what you're doing mm-hmm. sonically. Yeah. I feel like also when you change cymbal heights, how many times you have, it changes your perception a little bit because A, it's either you either have more things to choose from while you're playing or less things to choose right. from. So one right. could be a distraction yes. and one could be something where it's like, basic necessity um and kind of conservative almost in in how you're going to process doing a feel or uh playing a groove yeah um and so it's um it sounds like you're combining a little bit of kind of a utilitarian yeah type thing and and a vibe yeah because i mean you know you think about you play your ludwigs they have that older vintage sound yeah. and you play your more modern kit yeah um like I, i'm i'm a sakai user and with sakai drums like that's pretty much my default kit yeah and with with drums with drum heads evans if i need a vintage sound i'll put a j1 etch on the bottom mm. and a g12 coated on the top mm. So now, and these are maple, the Almighty Maple series. So now I have my vintage warm sound. Yeah. But then if I want a little bit of a uh, focus, uh, attack, I'll put a clear head on the bottom, keep the coated on the top. And mm. if I really want a modern pingy or whatever sound, just put mm-hmm. G2 clears on the top. Okay. And, um, and call it a day, you know. <laughs> um, and But most of the time... You know, and, and and it definitely starts with the kit for sure, but getting a good engineer, yeah, which is a whole other topic, sure, is is extremely critical when you're recording something because they're capturing supposed to be capturing your performance, yeah, and your performance. Let's just face it; I mean, it can be hindered if the engineer doesn't know what they're doing, right? You know, if if the snare is not loud enough, or mm. um, or the drums are mono when they're when they shouldn't be mm. or if it's all room mics when it's supposed to be focused or if it's too focused and it's supposed to be room mics right you know so it's like all these different things and the engineer that we have working down here today man, it's amazing and so every song we've been doing um he's been pretty on point as far as matching the vibe of the song that we're currently mm-hmm. co- recording as i swap snares in a cymbal mm-hmm. he swaps settings so okay. he's a part of the band and it yes. helps us to record better to get in the vibe mm-hmm. you know of, of that particular song so and you've been on the other end of that though i can imagine where the engineer is maybe working counterintuitive yeah to the band vibe and how do you handle that well i'm not the producer so uh, okay. uh, i'm not calling the shots he is sometimes that engineer if you find that it could become very very tense sometimes it's best to like you know back off because it becomes that whole cat and mouse of like who's working for who yeah you know are you working for me engineer or am i working for you as a drummer um and there kind of is a definitive answer to that um, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, but it is still working together. Right. Um, and if there's a producer involved, if there's a producer there's involved, then he should definitely be, you know, stepping in to say something. But I think that with engineers and when it comes to drums, it's like every engineer strongly believes that. They have worked on many different drum sets, many different um, drummers, and they have something worked out, figured mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Drummers, likewise, they've been working on their kit, different studios, different right. engineers, 
and they may have dialed in their sound. Mm -hmm. And so the two worlds kind of sometimes clash when you go in as a drummer thinking like, okay, you know, here's my sound. And, and then the engineer says, well, here's my sound. And it's like, wait a minute, (laughs) (laughs) well, wait a minute. Like (laughs) if you, okay, well, my sound is I'm the performer, you know, I'm, you know, I need my sound. Uh, like I'm, I'm kind of, I'm at your, um, kind of your uh, mercy. I'm, yeah, I'm straight up at your mercy. I mean, a guitar player can tweak their amp, mm-hmm. you know, and and all, and an engineer puts a mic, you know, finds a spot, but it doesn't. The guitar sound is what it is, mm-hmm. and with drums, if you put that mic too close to the head you're going to get overtones mm-hmm. if you're not careful um it, cause especially in certain rooms because certain rooms drums your kit may not sound that great in yeah so um it's a matter of like finding a sweet spot in that room first mm-hmm. to make sure that the toms resonate how you want kick drum is punchy snares like nice the um w- with the tom mic placement that's a kind of a big issue for me uh, because i like the toms to sound big i yes. like for them to have tone i like for them to have body and i like most of the time to be able to control the uh, resonance and again thankfully man and i say this happily about sakai drums i've never had a problem out of getting those toms to resonate yeah because Getting them to resonate, again, with the head combination the Evans that I use, getting those toms to resonate, that's a good problem, like, to have when they resonate for a long time, because yeah. I can fix that. Right, with right. a little moon gel, drum dots, gaff tape, whatever, you know, Yeah. and, and the Evans mini emads on the bottom heads, mm-hmm. I'll put that on the, under there, and it can tame the length of the sustain. So, uh, but a lot of times... Uh, going back to like you know mic placement if you had that mic too close you get these overtones and so sometimes when engineer turns his back i'll back the mic off (laughs) and um because i can hear i can hear those overtones yeah and a lot of times they don't they just think like oh you know i'm I'm put the mic here because this is where i always put the mic right this is what i was taught and this is this is what i was taught three finger rule and right and, yeah, all that of that stuff, as opposed crap. to using your ears yeah and they don't even come in and like listen um to they don't even come in to listen to the kit you know they don't even sit down behind the kit and play yeah you yeah. know and i'm like that's kind of a big deal you know yeah. so you can at least get this vantage point mm-hmm. um so back the mics off or just listen to just the overheads or just the room mics to mm-hmm. hear what those mm-hmm. sound like mm-hmm. and and you know back these other mics off a little bit because this kit may be a four finger kit <laughs> right exactly of a three finger well kit. especially if if you're bringing in if different drummers are bringing in different kits and it's not there it's not a house different kit the engineers tunings. yeah sure well two things um the uh, I don't remember what drummer it was but um a lot of times toms get shortchanged. Everyone's getting that kick snare, it's really hot, and you hit the toms, and sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, we sound check and we're just, you know, hammering out quarter notes on the toms, yeah. and then when I go to play the fill, it's not with the same intensity. No, it's not. Um, and uh, so there was a drummer, I, I wish I could remember, who said when he would sound check, he would play the toms a little bit lighter, mm-hmm. and the engineer would dial it in, and then when we would go to perform those toms would actually come out because i think we've all heard recordings or been to live events where you're hearing this boom fat boom fat it goes into the fill and it's just like whoa, 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 boom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fat. and like wait a minute i saw him play the toms cottonhead toms <laughs> exactly the other well, thing i wanted to say was uh sakai has been uh super awesome to us and is helping us oh, great, uh, uh, sponsor some episodes um, Sweet. For a little while here yeah. uh, for our podcast, including this one. Awesome. So, uh, my that, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They've been very uh, gracious. What's the model that you're using? I use the Almighty Maple. Okay. And I have the Ocean Fade finish. And it's a 10, 12, 14, 16. I have a 22 by 18 inch kick drum, and I have a 20 by 16 inch bass drum. Okay. 
snares that I use are the maple six and a half mm -hmm. snare, same finish, ocean finish, and a five and a half beach snare. Mm, yeah. And on that beach snare, I actually put a, um, a Evans 56 calf tone on it. Interesting. Because a beach snare is a pretty harsh, yeah. um, like it's a very bright, I shouldn't say harsh, but it's just a very sure. bright, like, uh -huh. you know, um, loud drum. So um, I countered it with the Evans calf tone and it sounds amazing. I used it, actually I had a session after I left Ocean Way yesterday out another part of town and I used that snare and it sounded amazing okay. for what we were doing. We were kind of doing a blues thing too, so it made made a lot of sense. I grew up uh, playing drums at church under my mom. Mm -hmm. She's an organist, mm -hmm. an organist, and um, and eventually I began playing drums at this church, uh, Olivet Baptist Church, okay. which is the church that Kirk Whalem's father was mm -hmm. a pastor for. Okay. And that's when I first met Kirk. I was, man, I think I was still in elementary school wow. and getting ready to go to junior high. How old were you when you first picked up sticks? Do you remember? Uh, I was told I was two. You were, <laughs> you had to be told because yeah, it was so I, young. <laughs> yeah. I mean, somewhere around in there, um, maybe, maybe one and a half, two, something like that. Um, and uh, the the drummer at the church would set me on his leg so that I could play up top and he would work the pedals mm -hmm. when the when the children's choir would sing. Okay. So I would play kind of with them because mm -hmm. the drums were just too big. And um, eventually, uh, let's see, when I was four or five, I played, there was like some talent show thing at, this place called <laughs> Rum Boogie Cafe <laughs> on Bill Street. It's like a five-year-old playing in a bar. <laughs> My parents were there. And I drank pina coladas with uh, cherries. <laughs> but um, I had a little, uh, what was that kid? It was a little red junior kit. And I played Knock on Wood. Yeah. And... Um, with this guy, Don McMahon, Lanny McMillan. And uh, anyway, playing playing that playing that music and, and playing along with vinyl records and, at the house from Earth, Wind & Fire, Billy Cobham, and Thompson Community Singers, you know, three different genres mm -hmm. of music. And I just kind of grew up in that. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't really get into jazz until junior high close to pretty much high school mm -hmm. uh with my dad and at, at memphis drum shop they were telling him and, and before memphis drops off streets and things but memphis drum shop uh jim cooper he said um um pet it excuse me it's on cooper street gotcha. sorry jim uh, he said to get to dave weckle mm, hardwired record so he got me the hard hardwired record first, and then they got me the master plan, which was Dave's yeah. first record. Yeah, and I was listening to that stuff, and I was like, "Man, who is this guy?" Mm -hmm. You know, and like, and started learning the songs, playing along with them, like we all do. And eventually, I got the uh, Buddy Rich Memorial video. Yeah. yeah, that changed my life. Which one? The, the one part with two. Weckle? The yeah. one Weckle, Gad, and Vinny. Yes, got mm -hmm. that one first. Mm -hmm and learn all the Gad stuff. Cause that was my introduction to Steve Gad. Sure. Um, in high school. And cause I had already known who, um, already knew who Weckle was and Gad just did something for me. Vinny, my brain couldn't process what he was doing yet. Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and then that was also my introduction to Buddy Rich because I, didn't know who Buddy Rich was okay. except for the black and white snippets that they would show. Yeah. Then eventually I got the Buddy Rich uh, story video of all his performances, right. um, part one and part two. Right. And, and this is kind of pre YouTube, pre access yeah. to all this stuff that's so when, easy. When VHSs were still, uh, when VHSs were still kind of relevant, and um, and so it's um. It's a trip now, yeah, the accessibility of everything yeah. 
that you that you can watch yeah. on YouTube and well, when I was in Columbus, I mean when I was at Columbus Pro Percussion and that DCI video came out, mm -hmm. we used to just go right to that oh, yeah. solo and watch that on, almost on a loop and every so often Wait, I had Steve Gads or or buddies the the the, the uh, on the Buddy Rich Memorial Scholarship concert uh -huh. when it was when they were trading Oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, we remember I mean <laughs> I I got to a point where I could play everybody's part. Vinny's was, you know, definitely a little sketch <laughs> as far as what I could do, what he was doing. But you know, I eventually got into Vinny, like yeah, for sure, really deep once I got to college. And but Buddy, I was all about Buddy Rich and mm -hmm. all of his mm -hmm. chops, and mm -hmm. literally with that VHS tape, you watch him on the other video and you hit yeah. pause 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 trying to see what yeah. he's doing on this west side story drum solo well in in kind of doing some more digging and mm -hmm. and trying to find out more about you and, yeah. and uh, i've seen videos of you in the past we have some mutual friends that have worked with you have talked about you i've known your name since i've been here the last 16 years it's certainly come up many times um but in watching some videos more recently I'm trying to kind of figure out where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can hear the Billy Cobham mm -hmm. and also Tony Williams mm -hmm. in spots. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's funny. Vinny, Billy, and Tony are kind of like, and, and Dennis Chambers too. Yeah. They're, I feel like Tony is kind of, the the ground zero yeah. of, of that because Tony what he was doing and I and I and I and I'm not saying that to say that, you know, none of the other guys were, you know uh icon or icons or well, it's almost like a Hendrix thing, where yeah, where you yeah. have somebody that breaks new ground mm -hmm. and then you pass the torch and right. then it's up to people to elevate that right which they which they have and even even going back to buddy people say oh you just you, you can't touch buddy rich and i think in well, many no, ways because he's in the grave <laughs> <laughs> but up yeah um and 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 yeah that's that's very true yeah. and but what's happened is as the as as the craft has evolved as it's changed and um I think what you're saying is is that Tony is ground zero for a certain way a certain of thing, correct a thing yeah and but there's also it was such a fusion of rock that was new to right. our world mm -hmm. and combining bebop and everything and obviously the the definition of fusion in its purest form I mean Tony was at the forefront of that totally man I mean, so. I think my point is, is I, when I was watching you play, there's fusion elements. There's Vinny. Right. I see Dennis Chambers, but there's a rock thing. There's a there's a strong, um, even like taking the time to just hit the snare drum once mm -hmm. and pause. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's a you're breathing. Mm -hmm. There's phrases. There's mm -hmm. stuff that I've seen Tony do. Right. Um, that made it that jump out to me in yeah. watching you play. So I, my point is, uh, I'm encouraging listeners to go watch some of these YouTube clips. Yeah, of you. um, and and Tony, like Tony, came from the bebop world. Yeah, you know, I feel like if you're a drummer, you do yourself kind of a disservice by not diving into the jazz stuff even if you don't play it professionally right dive into it yeah learn learn what you can of it because i mean you think about john bonham his moby dick drum solo oh, yeah is max roach's yeah. the drum waltzes or or you know i forget what song it was that yeah the drum also waltzes exactly um it's that solo but a lot of drummers don't know that. Yeah. And I remember when I first heard Bonham's solo, I was like, wait a minute, this is Max Roach's solo. Right. And and I actually, I wasn't offended by it. Not that it matters, but <laughs> uh, I wasn't offended by it because to me, he was paying homage to his favorite yeah, drummer. And exactly. I thought that was a very kind thing to do. Right. And, and, but you think about, uh, uh, Lear, um, 
what's the drummer Graham Lear uh, with uh, who played with Gino Vanelli. Okay. And if you get a chance to check out some Gino Vanelli stuff, mm -hmm. that drummer and Vinny played on some of Gino's stuff as well. His playing, the music itself is incredible, but his playing, he's playing rock, but he's got mm -hmm. these jazz chops too, mm -hmm. you know. And so I feel like when you have a rock drummer coming from that world, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. I mean, Tony, that's what Tony did. I mean, when he yeah. did the song Snake Oil, when he went into his whole fusion thing, it was like that Miles, I mean, shoot, Miles did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Herbie Hancock, when, yeah. you know, um, but Billy, I saw clips of him playing with Horace Silver, mm, wow. swinging, left-handed and right-handed. <laughs> and then, of course, his own solo projects. Yeah. And um, so I feel like when you when you when you take those chops and listen to the sounds that you hear tone wise, yeah, and just try to mess with that and not be so one dimensional, mm -hmm. unless that's your thing. If that's your thing, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person that wants to widen their yeah. scope a bit. Mm -hmm. um, Detuning snares, like just check out simple things like the sonic approach mm. because that will literally alter how you uh, do things as I said earlier symbols symbol heights yeah. tom heights and all that stuff I've recently two weeks ago three weeks ago started raising my symbols mm -hmm. up high mm. like to the point where if I were in the audience watching I'd be like that looks really corny <laughs> but <laughs> But I, I remember someone telling me years ago, like, man, you need to raise your cymbals up, man. You know, it's a show. And I was like, man, it's all about content. It ain't about all of the visual, yeah. you know. It is about that. So when you're talking <laughs> about raising your cymbals up. Literally. It was just for, for live shows. Just for live. I mean, I, 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 it's that in a studio right now, mm -hmm. they're up. And they're up so that I can can get used to playing like that so it's not such a physical stretch when gotcha. I'm playing live but it also it also still again makes you play different and it makes you commit because when they're really close mm -hmm. and you can just and you can just flick your wrist and hit something mm -hmm. it's like you can come you can become a little or I became a little lazy. Mm -hmm. But when you have to reach for it and work for it. I'm going to hit that crash. It's I'm gonna going happen. to hit that crash and mm -hmm. I'm not going to miss. Yeah. And everybody's going to know that I hit that crash. Yeah. And so it makes everything intentional. Right. Um, and the drums are still where they are. I'm not doing anything crazy with them, but the cymbals. And, you know, I, and I've talked to a couple um drummers that spent a lot of time in the studio and and i've asked this question because i remember uh when i was younger somebody said oh yeah raise your cymbals up high in the studio so that there's that separation and i think that might have been an old theory because um all, uh, most of the players that do spend a majority of their work in the studio said yeah i don't really worry about that no. you know that's that's not really an issue and and I'm sure things have changed. So that just seems like something that's a, yeah. a wash. Well, I want to I want to go from uh, Memphis to Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, was there any important mentors, teachers in Memphis or before you came up here that you can? In Memphis, yeah. Um, I mean, again, church musicians, um, yeah. you know, uh, drummer friends of mine uh, from a guy whose name was Andre. He played at Kirk's dad's church. He was a open. He was a left-handed player, but he played open-handed. And he yeah. had uh, what kit would he have? I don't think it was a Tama. He had. Uh, I know he had three racks. It was my first time playing three racks and one floor tom. And he had a ride tumble over here, a china, <laughs> he had a china in church. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but we would swap out, and and then also a guy named Jackie Clark. Um, who's an incredible bassist and keyboard player. And, of course, my mom, like I said, um, and Carlos Sargent, who I watched a lot growing up. Um, and then one other key person, um, her name is Yvette Prayer, baby girl. They call her baby girl. Mm. And she used to um, play at this club in Memphis called Rhythms. 
and she would have me sub for her mm. and i would go there every sunday and sometimes saturday i'm in high school and i would go down there and hang because i knew the guitar player and her and they would let me sit in and play mr magic or something mm. like that yeah. and let me solo mm -hmm. um and eventually i started getting the calls when she couldn't because she was still on the road with isaac hayes at the time oh, wow. so i would sub for her mm -hmm. and uh, I learned a lot, a lot. Another guy influence that influenced me heavily was a guy named John Williams, his bass player. Mm -hmm. He played at a church that my mom was playing, mm -hmm. and he was the first person to really teach me about pocket playing. Mm -hmm. And because you know my kick drum was just all over the place, and he was like, "No, no, 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 no," you know. <laughs> it's like because church man, when you get groomed in church, man, it's another thing um you know church musicians i mean people wonder why church musicians have such facility it's because you <laughs> it's it's such a uh you, you you can get embarrassed really quick so you have to learn really quick yeah. because you can't kind of half play because then they'll kick you off the drum i mean my mom kicked me off the drums you know <laughs> you know in the middle of a song Get off the drums. Tony, come over here and get on these drums. <laughs> like, can I finish the song first, please? Jeez. No, I, I get it. And it sounds like a lot of your mentors were non-drummers. So a lot of them were. Um, a lot of my favorite musicians, ironically, are, are non-drummers. Um, but I think that's really important because you're learning listening. You're learning yeah. how to play within a group. Yeah. Um, I mean, my favorite musicians... People like Herbie Hancock, mm -hmm. Kirk Whalum, Larry Carlton. I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I've toured with Kirk and Larry. Never with Herbie yet. Um, but Layla Hathaway, Bobby McFerrin, it's like mm -hmm. these are yeah. people who I like, I look up to when I hear them play, and I'm like, how do they do what they do? Mm -hmm. And even friends of mine living here in Nashville, yeah. so many friends of mine who mm -hmm. I'm proud and and humble to call them friends yeah you know um who i who i just esteem way higher than myself i want to hang on kirk whalem yes and tell me a little bit about that relationship and and so how that that story you've mentioned it a couple times in some of your bios you have online yeah so kirk um when he heard me play, he told me then, when I was in junior, uh, going to junior high, that he said, "You sound good. You know, if you if you learn to read, you keep practicing, and you'll play with me someday." Mm -hmm. And he stayed true to that word. Um, I've been hit with him now ten years, I believe, probably longer than that. Um, and he um, and tell us who Kirk is for oh, those who don't. So Kirk Whalem is a saxophonist who. An artist, I don't know how many records he has out, 30 something records. Um, and he, his, everybody has heard Kirk Whalem, okay. whether they know they have yeah. or not. Mm -hmm. They've, he's probably, I think he's the most heard saxophone player in the world be, because he played the saxophone solo on Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. Oh, wow. So you would have to literally be living under a rock to have <laughs> never heard that song right, or that right. saxophone solo. Mm -hmm. So every show, uh, we'll, we'll kind of play a little bit of that song for the newcomers <laughs> yeah. who never heard of him, who right. just drug out to the gig. Well, and for those of us, uh, before I moved to Nashville and at my age, I'm thinking, oh, that's really great. Uh, what, a, what a great song. And then to find out that's a Dolly Parton song. Right. Yeah. After the fact, where after I know the, there's right. people that are laughing at me, like, how did you not know that was a Dolly Parton song? I but didn't. it is a pretty amazing <laughs> song. But it was introduced to a larger audience, I yeah. think, because of that performance. And it's amazing to think that he was the sax player on that. And she, the story is, is I mean, she basically fought for her band, Ricky Lawson is on drums, yeah. Ricky wow. Minor on, on bass. Um, I think, I don't know if it was Doc Powell or Paul Jackson Jr., I can't remember. Uh, but it's basically, it was her touring band. And yeah. the story is basically when you see her standing at a microphone in the movie singing that song mm -hmm. she's actually singing 
to the film. She's actually singing. It's not an overdub. Now, there's a spot, you know, there are other clips where she's sitting, Mm -hmm. lip singing, but she fought with the producers, like, no, I want to sing it live to the film, and I want my band to play with me singing live to the film. And you can imagine a nightmare that these guys were like, uh... Yeah. That's, no, we're not doing that. And they bantered back and forth, and she eventually said, okay, fine, do it your way, um, but you're going to have to find a singer to sing it, because mm-hmm. if I sing it, I'm doing it live to the film mm-hmm. with my band. So they're behind this curtain, and you can actually see the curtain in the movie. They're back there playing the song, and after they played the song, um, I think it was David Foster, I think he was the one that produced this thing, and when they when they finished they took the um the rough mix to um clive and he said oh sounds great don't touch it it's like uh <laughs> this is a rough mix and they they um they didn't agree on how everything should go but obviously clive won so it's like you're listening to pretty much a rough mix that's uh, with a little See, bit I want to go listen to that right now. Yeah, with That's a little awesome. bit of reverb sweetening happening on it. Mm-hmm. But um, now, I, and again, you know, I may have, you know, I wasn't there and I can't really piece together the story accurately. So I don't want to. But still, but, but just Kirk's. That's Kirk's solo. And yeah. That, and, and when you see her um, uh, performances from the 90s mm-hmm. you'll see him on there she would call okay. him the preacher and she, she would she would have him come out and do amazing grace like he was literally featured a lot with her mm. um because he was already an artist too at the time okay so and then of course um however many records later um he has been doing his thing and um we've we've recorded Recently, the last record we did was a DVD called The Gospel According to Jazz, Chapter 4. Okay. And it's a DVD. We shot it in New York at the, in Brooklyn. And it's basically his touring band. Yeah. He used us on this DVD. And yeah. it's a nice, pretty lengthy, nice DVD. Yeah. And um, he let every, everybody's featured on it. I have a solo on there and... Everybody. I think I saw that. That's I think uh, Vic Firth has a nice video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me ask you something about that. Um, was it one night mm-hmm. performance? It okay. was. It was one night. Um, we. The idea w- at, uh, initially was for us to come in the night before, which we did, play and have them get some other shots and some other stuff, just like close-up stuff. Um, but we ended up not using any of that. Mm-hmm. So we went with the, um, the night the, where the, people were there. Cause right. we didn't even have, we didn't even wear the same stuff the night before. Well, that seems silly. Cause that's, yeah. you know, you think that that you want some consistency. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, I mean, so you don't see any of that. Did the, did they mention that to you? So guys, we need you to wear the same clothes cause we're going to be doing these shots. Honestly, at this point, I can't even remember. You can't remember. I can't well, here, here's what I wanted to get to was, um, there's times, you know, there's the whole red light syndrome and you spend a lot of time in the studio. You get used to that and it's not as much of an issue, mm-hmm. but, um, and sometimes that elevates your performance mm-hmm. when you know that the red light's on. Mm-hmm. And there's times that even live, when you're tracking something live for whatever reason, it, there's a there's a whole different thing that's going on. Mm-hmm. There's some, you know, just uh, your just your blood pressure is elevated. You know, all those kinds of things. Yep. I mean, was that an issue for you guys, or is, has it been an issue for you? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, you're I'm you're always nervous in one setting or another. You never really shake that. You yeah. just use it to your advantage at, yeah. at at some point. Yeah. The going into the studio for me is kind of that. Like where you're mm-hmm. like, Oh man, this is being documented. Right. You know what I mean? So people can hit rewind. So you, you like sometimes you end up overthinking it and yeah. you wanna punch this in and do this over and and then it becomes too um sterile. Mm-hmm. So um but I find personally that I perform a lot better when there are people watching. 
Yeah. Because that's my normal environment. Yeah. Um, so, like, doing a live recording, f- for example, there, when we did the DVD, there were a couple tunes that we cut, we finished, and then we had to redo it. We had to recut it. Oh, interesting. Right after. So With like, the audience there. The audience is there. Yeah, I mean, we were there. We started recording at about 7.30. We didn't walk off the stage till 2.30 a.m. 2.30 in the morning? Yeah. And the audience was there with you? Most of them. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, it just kept oh, standing out because people started moving down further and further because the camera and production, they were like, all right, move the people down, move the people down, move the people down. So, um, but I um, was more so just kind of like, we got, we, we re- like I said, we re- cut a couple tunes and the song that I have my solo on I actually when we got to the end of it I wanted to redo that because I was mm. like mm, it sounded great on it had a better man. one and um, but Kirk was like no that's it I was like oh, it okay. sounded it was killer dude so, it was um, awesome so yeah but it's an audience there yeah so it, it you know when an audience is there it makes you commit even more because that's an immediate documentation mm-hmm. mentally for people yeah. watching. Yeah, um, I don't hear the playback. Yeah. You know, at, at the moment you're playing something live, but on a CD, it's like I, I'm I'm going to hear that playback, and I'm made like it or I may not like it. Right. So it makes you sometimes a little reserve and I'm and I'm that's something that my own personal issue that I have to work through and like well, but but to your point is interesting a couple of years ago I uh, recorded a live CD we recorded two nights mm-hmm. and uh, so I remember one night I had a, a click going on this one song mm-hmm. and uh, the band felt locked in and we're all and I'm the only one with the click yeah the next night something was different um, the, I just could not keep the band reined in and so i'm just like screw this i knocked the click off yeah we finished the rest of the song and i was like well i've got the night before Mm -hmm. fast forward i'm listening to a b and the two different versions the one that i had to knock the click off just had this energy yeah and this this we ended up using that one yeah you know it's like okay we we got off the click but you didn't it wasn't a noticeable tempo change right but the intensity was there, and um, yeah. so that that to my fault wasn't able to maintain that intensity with the click. But I tell you, it 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 there was that live performance that was captured that was great. You know, you can't. I mean, the thing is, like when you're the only one listening to the click, it's really hard to get everybody else to. I'm like people, the band. I tell you, I'm following you. I'm following you. No, you're not, because <laughs> you're pulling me yeah. and you're dragging me, and I'm you know stand with this click and i can't do that if i have to nanny yeah sometimes you have to like players. get off and like you know leave the click a little bit like come on all right now i'm gonna pull you back in. yeah but i mean you know it, it, and that's that's a whole another issue and debate right, right, and right 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 you know it's people are you know why are you using a click live and that's you know yeah. it's like there's the whole like i don't mind different counting musical off situations in the first eight bars and then turning it off but i just <sighs> Are you using any other device to help keep time? No, I mean, I'll just use the Frozen 8 metronome app on my phone. Okay. And I'll just kind of watch it, you know, as long as I can. I don't have it going into my ear, but I'll just watch it before I count off a song and go into the song. And if I feel, I'm, I, if I can feel the bass player, the keyboard player, the, the leader, singer, saxophone, if I feel something energy wise changing mm-hmm. I try to find where that happy place is because yeah. I'm still the nucleus of this whole thing but uh, I need to make sure that we're all balanced and, right. and, and uh, because people play relative to where you are so if they play behind the beat no matter if you get slower yeah. they're going to still be behind you yeah. if they play ahead of you if you get faster they're still going to be ahead of you yep. so you have to be rock solid and say i'm not gonna move once i know that this is the happy spot if you're gonna play behind the beat then so be it i'll just have to do my best to like try to either ignore you or and i don't mean that you know direct, no i understand you know, but but like it but sometimes if i hear somebody playing behind me i become um 
nervous in in thinking that I'm rushing. Yeah. Because you're playing behind me. Yeah. So I and I don't want to feel like I'm pulling you or rushing you, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're the leader. Mm -hmm. um, no matter who I'm playing with. So once I figured that out, I was like, okay, I get it now. Um, now it's just some fine tuning within my own limbs. Hi hat placement. Is it ahead or is it center? Snare placement. Is it behind? Is it center? Mm -hmm. Kick drum. Is it center or is it behind or is it ahead? Mm -hmm. Like those little micro things. Um, and even going into certain fills, mm. upbeats, um, pushing or pulling. Are your upbeats pushing or pulling? Or are they right in the center? Um, and a lot of my favorite drummers from Jeff Picaro to Buddy Rich to Ricky Lawson to Harvey Mason, you hear a lot of that stuff when they were playing off the grid um, which the grid didn't exist in. Right. Um, <laughs> but you hear them play upbeats and it's got this lean to it where it's like pushing. And then as soon as they come back on a downbeat, it's like back. Mm. And, and that's kind of genre specific too because sometimes in jazz, um, certain tempos, like Count Basie, those backbeats, and those uh, upbeats rather, she, uh, uh, and they kind of sit on the back side mm -hmm. but then some when you get in the pop it kind of sits on the edge yeah and then the groove is on the back side whereas in jazz sometimes the groove is on the top side depending so on so like a backbeat like the two and four well I mean when well, straight ahead jazz okay um, or shuffles mm -hmm. like you listen to Art Blakey mm -hmm. um, and you hear him play it go into a solo his time doesn't move it just has this forward momentum yes yeah yeah where it's just on the fringe of like pushing um tempo almost it feels like the tempo maybe is pushing but it's really not yeah right. um there is a forward momentum this yeah. thing that's this energy that's there without it being rushed mm -hmm. and and a click really can't give you that yeah you know because you try to play and get some motion happening with the click, it's just not going to feel the same. Like, I've heard recordings that I played on, and we played to a click, and the song didn't necessarily call for a click. Mm -hmm. And I think that as producers and musicians get more... Um, as, as, as we continue to make music will say, well, the song doesn't need that pattern. We, we go into this whole thing of like, the song needs this, the song doesn't need this, uh, instrument-wise. But seldom do we say the song does or does not need click. We'll say the musician or the band does or does not need click, but sometimes the song is You think it needs to happen more often. You need, no. We need to have that option. We need to have that option more, yes. That's what I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to say no click or yes. But don't yeah. you think that that's becoming an uphill battle as we are working in a more uh, at, you know, uh, um, digital environment with the grid? And yeah, the, but uh, at the same time, what's the whole purpose of tracking to the grid? Mm -hmm. Like, what? what's your... what? What's the achievement? Like, are you, what are you afraid that's going to happen if we don't track to a clip? Well, and, and this is, and I'm not making an argument for it, but what I'm saying is, like, this be, this has become almost industry standard. Yeah. So that somebody can say, well, I want to have options afterwards. But options, and I think that's kind of my thing, is like, mm -hmm. what are the options for? Like, if you're going to, if you're going to fly the drums from a section to another section, yeah. then I get it, you know. Uh, but if you're not going to be moving the drums, yeah. say, for example, if you're going to have strings to overdub or horns or background vocals to overdub to the drum track that's solid top to bottom, yeah, that is your click, the drum. Right, exactly. You don't need... Maybe it's an click, arrangement cause, cause, option. Like, well, what if we we might want to double the chorus at the end, and and you know, or something. I mean, but, but even but, then, it's like you know, guy, yeah. all the recordings that that have, that that has happened, yeah. where in the seventies, yeah, where they didn't, you know, uh, and they used tape, right? 
you know so like flying stuff back then that was a bit hard like for example perfect example uh on working day and night michael jackson off the wall project mm-hmm. that middle section where jr is playing uh, it's a breakdown and he's playing a that section that is a loop they took that and looped it and when you listen to it on headphones you can't hear it my friend demarco told me this a couple years ago when you listen to it on headphones you can actually hear the start over oh my god on the loop yeah and i said i'll be doggone yeah you can't hear it and now on the stereo system no you can't hear it you know but right headphones now now it's headphones yeah (laughs) you can hear everything and and i and i actually like that because it's still accurate. Right. But it just goes to show you some of the methods that they used back then. Like, they did some of the same stuff people do today, which is take a section and loop it or right. do whatever. So it's nothing different. It's like sometimes we think that he played that down at one time, and, and that's cool to think that. Because right. uh, now we do it. Natural Jazz Workshop, I've been teaching and performing there for a number of years now and i'm actually my rehearsal is there today yes, right um and i'm playing there this saturday as well and next friday um that particular um group is nashville's like top jazz everything i mean it's like they teach there um from the standpoint of a player then a teacher Mm. um because everybody that teaches there i mean they're working musicians Mm -hmm. they're not just teachers right so they're coming with experience yeah um the um so i've yeah i've been fortunate to play with so many different people via Nashville Jazz Works. What about somebody that's interested in getting involved as a student there? Dude, yeah. Um, go to Nashville, is it NashvilleJazz.org, I believe. Okay. Um, NJW, um, just Google NJ, NJW Jazz uh, Nashville. Sure. Um, and are and there certain age ranges? or No, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty wide. Mm-hmm. Um, I've taught... You know, from junior high to um, to the grave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's like the the whole thing is they want you if if whether you're just doing this as a hobby or wanting to further your career, they want you to come and and they have stuff to offer. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no question. I mean, they have the material um, and more so than the combined knowledge and wisdom to effectively teach yeah. you how to do certain things and give you the framework. And at that point, then it's definitely on you, which yeah. is kind of like in general when it comes to teaching music, like I can only teach you what I can teach you. Yeah. When are you going to do the work? Exactly. You know, when somebody comes, can you teach me jazz? It's like, well, okay, well, what are you listening to? Yeah. Well, I listen to, you know, a lot of rock, countries. Like, okay, first of all, you need to be listening to what you're asking me you want to play. Right. Because what it sounds like you're telling me is that you want me to teach you how to play. Mm-hmm. That's a pattern. That's not teaching you how to play jazz. Mm-hmm. That's just a pattern. Right. Just because you know how to do that now does not mean you know how to play jazz. Mm-hmm. So, um just like learning how to count to 10 in Spanish saying that I know how to speak Spanish, you know, I like that. not really. Right. Um, so when, so yeah, learning that's that music, whatever it is, you got to listen to it, you know, right. and, and at the jazz workshop, they have man a wall of CDs and records and vinyls and videotapes. So it's like nice. go in this room and listen. Yeah. And it's like, this, but this generation, man, it's, we're so Instantaneous. Removed. Yeah, we're so removed from listening to a whole, what was the last whole record you listened to? Mm-hmm. Top to bottom. Mm-hmm. We listen, we go to 
stream something. God, uh, we go to stream something or download a song. Yeah. And we don't listen to it top to bottom anymore. Mm -hmm. So you don't ever get the full picture of the project. Right, songs were placed in order on a record for a for purpose. a reason. Right. Yeah, it's not it's not alphabetized, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people we, we're not we don't we don't listen all the way down. Uh, anyway, they have all this, these resources at the jazz workshop. The Marcus Finney Group. Um, I have my own record out that I put out mm, six years ago, I believe. My first solo project um, and all original music. And I'm currently working on my second and third project right now. Yeah. And it's taken me forever because it's so expensive. <laughs> and but but my goal in this project is to actually use all Nashville musicians, as many as I can get, wow. um, appropriate for the song. And um and so and 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 it's and it's and it's, it's to heighten the awareness of the players here in Nashville because we have some awesome players here you know and that's another thing I wanted to ask you yeah. about I, I hope we I mean no, let's I want to talk about you know make sure that that you have your own group and make that known but I also one of the questions because we have such limited time here yeah. I just want to address this because it's just been weighing on me mm -hmm. I'm such a huge fan of jazz and I study it continue to study it I used to play it a lot more but still crave it and I live in Music City, USA, but I have a hard time finding it readily accessible the way I did when I was in Columbus. Can right. you, being involved in that community, explain to me why this is such an issue? The last time I saw good jazz was when I was at the airport <laughs> waiting <laughs> and saw Jerry Navarro <laughs> playing. Yeah, um, so we've had a couple jazz clubs here and well excuse me I, let me take that back we've had a couple of places that hosted jazz music hosted um, jazz <laughs> um, in town and 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 to be honest right now the jazz workshop is the only place and it's not officially a jazz venue because it's right. a school right so it's the closest that we're going to get to a place where you can go and perform with no parameters yeah. And play your heart out and and things, but like these other places here. But why and and is there any move to change any movement to change this? Well, especially with this yeah, influx there, of there musicians is, and great musicians here. There is a place uh, uh, that I've read called Rudy's Jazz Room that's supposed to be opening in the Gulch okay. later this year. Okay. And what I've heard and what I've read, uh, more so what I've heard, because uh, I don't think I read this particular part. They are going to feature music from 5 p.m. till 2 or 3 a.m. Okay. Three or four different groups a night. Okay. Um, I don't know if they're trying to do that with just local groups because that's going to be a problem uh -huh. if you're just trying to, because we don't, this isn't New York. Yeah. You know, where it's like a jazz club on every corner like Walgreens right you know or Starbucks yeah. um, this is Nashville so but there's honky tonks there's 20 honky tonks yeah. going on from 10 a.m. till 2 a.m. exactly so I mean hopefully and I'm saying that to say hopefully they'll be bringing in uh -huh. artists okay uh, to build I hope to, so. to build a oh brand because you I, I mean so. it's hard to build a brand with just local artists you have to like bring in some top name people yeah. so that people go oh wow they have yeah. such and such so let me go here and check yeah. this place out oh this place is actually starting to develop a reputation for having quality acts here so i would argue gonna, though i would say that 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 you you could do a lot of local stuff and i think you would attract people no 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 to, you, you can still sure. you can still do that mm -hmm. but just doing it on that alone because mm -hmm. think about it, i mean mm -hmm. like i've done gigs where you have Sometimes people come out, sometimes people don't. Um, sometimes it's a matter of um, consistency. Like, yeah. we, we don't have one place we can play all the time. Now, yeah. when, I, when we did the um, Smooth Jazz Festival, I know it's Smooth Jazz and not, you know, straight ahead, but when we did that jazz festival, uh, what, two months ago now, um, at the Fontanelle, 
there were so many people that came mm -hmm. out to that event mm -hmm. and it was it was great there were definitely some issues that can and should be addressed which i think they probably already have in planning for next year but one of those issues was weather that's like nobody could predict yeah, that there can. was going to be a monsoon and a lightning storm before the last two headliners went up so oh my gosh. um and and it rained so long that you know people had to leave some people waited in their car thinking they were going to come back but it was like no yeah. it's just too dangerous that's, that's what happens so yeah, yeah. As, and outdoor events in general by the way promoters <laughs> musicians hate them we hate outdoor events because we don't like fighting the wind and the heat and all that stuff just get inside <laughs> just do it inside um, save your money on insurance save your money just do on it insurance. Yeah, just do it inside man anyway um so part of the other thing with with you know venues i don't know i don't know that if there's a system or something <laughs> that that like I don't know what it is with Nashville and a jazz venue club. Like we used to have Cafe One Two Three. I mean, yeah. not Cafe. Excuse me, Cafe Milano. That was the only jazz place that I can remember okay. uh, when I got here in '99. F. Scotts. F. Scotts was a restaurant that hosted jazz. Hosted jazz. Cafe One Two Three hosted jazz. Um, any other place? Cafe Milano Jazz Club. Jazz Club with food. So with you, food. Yes, because Cafe Milano. I went to see Dave Weckl there. They were bringing Joe Sample. So you would have... It was downtown just north yeah, of... Yes. Right I by Demas's. I saw Weckl. Demas's, Demas whatever. Was that 2000, 2001? 2000? I think they had were on their Multiple. down slope in 2000, 2001, something like that. Yeah. But I saw Weckl in 99. I believe it was, yeah, the fall of 99. Um, I think that was... Yeah, I was. I think I was there. That's right when I moved to town. Yeah, me so too. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was just there. We were so, both there. Um, but the um, and the food was great. Mm. Um, and 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 I guess that's kind of another thing. It's like you had you had places that were really trying to like host jazz, but didn't really think the think about the clientele expectation as far as far as okay. We want to hear some jazz, but we want to eat too, mm -hmm. and we want to have beverages too. Yeah, you know. So, and and it needs to like look a certain way, especially if you're the only one. I mean, and again, in New York, you can go to a grungy jazz spot, and you're okay with it because there's so many jazz clubs mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, here, you have to make it count. You can't have a grungy looking place. Yeah. It can't be like the basement, or it can't be like, you know, um, what used to be French Quarter. Yes, um, yes. It's like, you know, you have yeah. to, it has to be nice yeah. to represent what we think of as jazz. Yeah. Um, so, we uh and then you know there's this whole fear like there there are a lot of great players here but a lot of them kind of stay under the radar as far as playing jazz because they you know oh. the whole stigma of like oh don't tell anybody you play jazz because you won't get calls which is really and i'll go on air and say this man it's 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 bs man as if somebody's gonna show up and play bebop licks on a country session yeah, yeah. you know part of me feels like there's an insecurity from mm. the other players like oh man he plays jazz so we probably he's probably going to think that we're beneath him mm. or mm -hmm. or they come up with some erroneous excuse like oh he's probably going to get bored mm -hmm. it's like let me make that decision mm -hmm. let the player make the decision you don't make that decision attitude could could could, there could be a myriad of reasons why your attitude yeah. would, be, would change, good or bad. Yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. and and then so people would say, "Don't don't tell anybody I play jazz." It's like, no, man. You know, you need to know like you have that headroom. People need to know that you have that headroom. Mm -hmm. I can play at this level if I need to, mm -hmm. but if I also need to reach a little higher, I I have more stuff I can pick from. In 2005 was probably one of the busiest years because I was on tour with Billy Preston, Donna Summer, and Larry Carlton at the same time. Jeez. And um, so, you know, I would go out with Donna for a couple of weeks, come back home for three days, and then go to Europe with Billy for a week, come back home for 
four or five days, then go back to Europe with Larry Carlton for two and a half weeks, come back. And then um, when I get when I got back, I think I had like a week or two off and then I was back out with Donna for the rest of the summer. No pun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and then intermittently back out with Billy and Larry. So. Um, so, yeah, that year. Um, and I was fresh out of college too because I had graduated in right. 2004 a year a year you know before um, but spending that time on the road playing with three artists who are actually established artists and pretty diametrically who, opposed well, stylistically yeah, stylistically extremely extremely different but equally in, in, intense because every one of them was a master at their craft. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where I'm getting at. It's like, I'm, I was very fortunate to play with masters of their craft. Yeah. Um, not playing a tracks and, you know, bubble gum stuff. And then trying to switch gears. That was the common thread with all these yes. different artists. Yes. All, pretty much just about everybody listed. Um, oh, I, I never really played with anyone where their lead vocal was canned. I've never actually played with anybody. So yeah. if you sounded bad, you just sounded bad, but it was okay um, yeah. because you were performing, period. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, everybody that I've performed with, thankfully. That's awesome. Yeah. Is there anybody, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, is there anybody that you haven't played with yet that you're like, this would be my dream gig? Yeah. Um, Sting, <laughs> Herbie Hancock, um, Bobby McFerrin. Um, yeah. Again, three different genres. <laughs> three different. <laughs> sure. Hey, maybe they'll, you know? they'll go out together and, you know, because yeah, I could that'd see be, that as a awesome. combo, especially with Sting and yeah. Peter Gabriel out on tour. Marcus Miller. Yeah. Um, you're putting together a band right now, man. I am technically, yeah, I guess so. Because um, <laughs> most, I mean, and and to be honest, like I've played with, I played with people who I've always wanted to play with, including Kurt. You know, that's awesome. You know, he was one of the, the guys growing up. My dad would play his music in the car, and my dad was more of a fan of his than I was at the time. Because <laughs> again, I'm in junior high. I'm all about drums. I don't care about other instruments. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, then playing with Kirk learning a lot that's whole his whole band by the way again like i said kevin turner from columbus ohio mm -hmm. yeah. braylon lacy on bass from dallas he plays with erica badu as well john stoddard keyboard player incredible arranger singer mm, wow has written and played bobby uh has written for bob james um take six al Jarreau, um yeah. just incredible cat he um that particular configuration of players when we go out on the road and this is going to speak to more of uh, uh, what makes the working drummer stay working yeah when we go out on the road kirk i don't know if it was divine or strategy or if it just was chance but he put together a group organization period not just the players but even management and the sound engineer we all, when we go out on the road, we all, I mean, hey, we all love God. We all love our family, our wives. Um, and so that's a common, that's a big deal as far as like mm -hmm. being on the road. Because if you have those, at least those two things mm -hmm. first, everything else is kind of like, that's you're gonna have so much in common, I, I believe, and and we all love music too. So, right. so we go out, we can individually hang out with whoever, whatever combination. It's not like I'm, I'm just gonna hang with the bass player, or mm -hmm. I'm just gonna hang with the keyboard player because we get along. Yeah, than yeah, I yeah, do. yeah. It ain't that, man. It's like because you guys have some very strong common uh, yeah. priorities. You share those priorities, right? And 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 it starts with Kirk. Mm. It's because he's the head. Yeah. And he has such a way of dealing with things in such a positive way um, that there's really not any drama. 
That's you know, awesome. It's not any drama that we have to deal with. Um, and we, everything is about communication, not, like hearing, hearing the other person's idea. Oh, what do you think about this? Oh, it's not it's like, a mutual it's not, it's respect. Not, it's not a do this thing. Mm-hmm. It's a what do you think about this? Or maybe like everything st- everything is an imperative question <laughs> you know, if if that makes any sense like sure maybe, he's maybe trusting he you he's he's honoring your input yeah yeah it's still in 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 spite of being the leader he's right. still and that i think that makes a good leader though right the trust exactly, it, exactly. because that because lack of trust is is a dictatorship <laughs> you yeah. know leader let's trust who you hire that's yeah. why you're the leader. It doesn't make you any less of a leader yeah. just because you're not calling all the shots all yeah. the time. Yeah. So where I'm getting at is like the the fact that after gigs, we're like, hey, let's go get something to eat. Let's go hang. You mm-hmm. know, let's go do this. Let's go do that. We have early morning flights at times yes. where we have to be in the lobby at 4.30 a.m. Yep. That's when you find out who is <laughs> in your camp. <laughs> yes. And I've been on other gigs where you um, you have the curmudgeons. Yeah. Um, no matter how old. <laughs> and it's tough. It's, it's tough. It's very tough. You don't want to, like, right. you just sit, I put headphones on in certain groups and I'm like, I don't even want to, like, I can't, like, and, and I'm talking about even f- doing the the cardinal sin, talking about politics and religion. Yeah, yeah. we do that because. Well, if you feel the situation out and you know that maybe yeah. it's something, especially religion, if it's if that's an important part of your life, right. especially with if you know if, the, if your faith is a big part of who yeah. you are, and there's that common thread exactly. that ties you together as exactly. a band, and then, and then we, that makes sense. We pray before every gig, mm. um, and. Um, well, we got text threads where it's like if somebody in a family is not doing well, say, hey, brothers, I need you guys to pray, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's a good unit and it's a awesome. good support system. And it's not it's we don't have any of those like crazy road stories. You know what I mean? Um, that's uh, that's crazy. What you're telling me is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is because, like, I, again, <laughs> you know, um, I've been on the road with those groups. Yeah, before yeah. and well, and so. it's a it's a very important point. And it's something that we've discussed off and on throughout this series. Yeah, um, we just had our seventy fifth episode come out oh, yesterday. That was Peter Erskine, right? Peter Erskine. Yeah, That's man. Correct. The man. And it has been. Um, it has been a common thing, especially like you recognize being a working musician, a working drummer. Right. Part of it is music. Yeah. Part of it is personality. Yeah. And it's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I challenge, you know, it's a struggle for me. It's something that's just really common. Yeah. Marcus, you're awesome, man. You're more awesome. Thank you for your time and uh, and hanging with me and, and just giving some insight. Thank I you. I really appreciate it, man. No worries. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, dude. So there you go. There is Marcus Finney. Appreciate him taking the time to sit down and talk to me uh, in his busy schedule. I encourage you to go to YouTube and check out some of Marcus's playing. Uh, he's an incredible player and a great musician. Uh, it was uh, it was really inspirational to talk to him and get some ideas from him. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation as well. My thanks, as always, goes out to Mike Jackson for his technical help. Stay tuned next week for Zach Albetta and his interview. Uh, Everyone, we just appreciate your support, uh, listener feedback, uh, anything that you guys um, just have to offer as far as spreading the word and uh, helping us grow. It's much appreciated. We've had a great month uh, this month, and we're hoping that the year just continues to grow for us. So anyways, I hope to see you around. Bye-bye.